Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host. And this week, I want you to meet somebody I call a friend, Neil Blumenthal, co-founder and CEO of Warby Parker, a transformative lifestyle brand that offers designer eyewear at a revolutionary price while leading the way for socially conscious business. Neil launched Warby Parker in 2010, just five years later, Fast Company named Warby Parker the most innovative company in the world. The company has grown to over 200 brick and mortar locations, is valued at over $1.5 billion, and they've distributed over 15 million pairs of glasses through Buy a Pair. Give a Pair program. Prior to Warby Parker, Neil served as the director of Vision Spring, a nonprofit social enterprise that trains low-income women to start their own businesses, selling affordable eyeglasses to individuals living on less than $4 per day in developing countries. Neil was named a Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum and one of the 100 most creative people in business by Fast Company. He serves on the boards of Allbird, Sweetgreen, and RX Art. Neil received his BA from Tufts University and his MBA from Wharton. And with that, Let's welcome Neil. I want to go back to the beginning. You, your amazing co-founders, sitting there at Wharton, came up with the idea. What was the moment we were like, this is a business, let's go? It was really after our first conversation. So Dave was complaining about losing a $700 pair of glasses in the seat pocket of an airplane right before school started. And as full-time graduate students, it wasn't like any one of us were going to spend that sort of money buying glasses. And I sort of chimed in that I used to run a nonprofit that would train low-income entrepreneurs in the developing world to start their own businesses, giving vision screenings and selling glasses when communities where people are living on less than $4 a day. And I remembered when I would visit the factories where I was sort of manufacturing and sourcing glasses for people living on less than $4 a day. And on the same production lines were some of the biggest names in fashion like Lon Vaughn and Marc Jacobs. And it was clear that the cost to produce glasses didn't rationalize the high prices that, for example, Dave uh, had experienced when he bought his $700 pair of glasses. So there was like this aha moment of a conversation, but it was cut short because we had to go to class. And then later that night, I shot Dave an email and also shot Andy and Jeff, our, who would become our other co-founders, who we were all sitting having this conversation. And uh, I was just up and couldn't sleep because the idea was going through my head. So I shot them an email. It was like midnight. And at 12.01, Dave responded. And then Jeff responded and Andy responded. So it was probably that moment that I thought that there was a potential here um, and we need to sort of think about this and and talk about it some more. What were the decisions that you made, like home try on, that you think unlocked instant consumer demand? Like now that you've had a lot of distance, it's been 13 years, what do you think worked? What were the two or three decisions that you're like, that's why we were successful? Yeah, I think there were a few things that were novel that led people to talk about us and right things that are novel that people talk about then you can grow really quickly because suddenly things go, right, quote unquote, viral. So this idea of selling glasses that would typically cost four or $500 for $95, right? I think we got pricing right and pricing is really hard. And at one point we thought that we should price at $45 instead of $95. And we spoke to the head of marketing at Wharton because we were all MBA students. And he said, $45, one-tenth of the price of something that you'd find elsewhere. That's just outside the realm of believability and price is the biggest indicator of quality. So getting it obviously low enough that people want to talk about it and and buy it and they were going to save tons of money, but not too low that people would think that it was crappy and, and not good quality. Selling online, like we all take it for granted, but at the time, right, we launched in 2010, Zappos was getting a lot of attention for selling shoes online, Blue Nile getting attention for selling engagement rings, right? Categories that people didn't think could be sold online. So selling glasses online was novel. That led people to talk about us. And similarly, we came up with this idea of a home try-on where we ship people five pairs of glasses. They had five days to try it on at home. Um, And that eliminated, I think, the barriers to purchase online. 
because for glasses, people want to touch and feel them. They want to put them on their face and see how they fit and, and how they look. And I think by having a free home try on that, right, removed any hesitation for people to shop from us. And because that was also novel, people spoke about us. What advice do you have to people about kind of your boundaries and your rules of building an excellent, long-lasting brand? Yeah, I think the first rule is to invest a lot of time into it. And what is a brand? It's a reason for being. It's a description of who you are and why. So it serves as almost a guidebook for actions going forward, whether it's mission, vision, values, different descriptors, because in order to convey an authentic brand, you need lots of details. And you can't have details and nuance unless you invest time and, and money into it. So I remember the days where Jeff, Andy, Dave, and I were working on our business plan. Um, and we probably spent the most of the time really focused on the brand. We would collect images to create a mood board, and then we would discuss why we selected those images. So for example, one of the images was a blue-footed booby, and this is uh, the unofficial mascot of Warby Parker. And why is a blue-footed booby relevant for Warby Parker? There's always been a tie between vision and learning, right? You often need glasses to, to read. A blue-footed booby often has a quizzical look on its face. It's curious. It kind of looks like a penguin, so it's kind of wearing a tuxedo, so it's sharp and stylish. Bright blue webbed feet, so it's got a little bit of flair and quirk to it. And their blue feet inspired the Warby Parker blue that you often see, um, you know, in Warby stores or sort of any Warby collateral. We would spend hours and hours debating certain words and um, why it makes sense for us. We would do exercises like if we were a car, what type of car would we be? The discussion sort of led to sort of more details and more nuance. And that's really important to build an authentic brand. And I think in this day and age, right, in the age of the internet, you can't hide and customers can sniff out authenticity in a heartbeat. So to create authenticity, right, you need details and depth. Um, and that's why it's important to spend time on, on the brand. I mean, it took us six months and over 2,000 names to come up with the name Warby Parker. And we discovered it uh, at the New York Public Library. Um, and why is the New York Public Library relevant? Uh, again, because there's that tie between vision and learning and reading and writing. Um, and when we would talk about the brand, we would talk about uh, in the early days, how we were inspired by the eyewear that our grandparents wore in the 50s, but also the social ethos of our parents who came of age in the 60s during the civil rights movement, for example. And then we married a little art and science and surveyed a bunch of friends and asked them, hey, what do you think about the name Warby Parker? So it was this great sort of validation that we have something that people immediately think sounds familiar, that is either positive or neutral, and then it has no association. So we have a blank canvas from which to sort of build from. Can you go back and talk a little bit about the tech playbook? Talk a little bit about how tech forward you were as well. Yeah, you know, when we were setting out to start the company, we realized we needed to in invest three things to get it off the table and, and to really make it a reality. And that was we needed a product so we could sell something. So we designed our first collection. We needed a place to sell it, which was going to be a, a website. Um, and we need to let people know that we existed um, and then promote and raise awareness about the brand. Building a website wasn't as easy uh, as it is now. There weren't tools like um, Shopify, for example. So we had to sort of build our e-commerce site and sort of our entire stack um, from scratch. We always put sort of technology at the heart of the company because we thought we could create better customer experiences um, if we had great technology. So we've always thought, okay, what are customer problems and how are we going to solve them? Some of those solutions were really based on technology. So we developed the first of its kind true to scale virtual try on. And that was actually a real technological challenge. I remember it, Neil. 
I remember it felt almost sci-fi. So we had to wait for the hardware to develop, frankly, for Apple to launch the true depth camera for us to be able to take measurements in order to properly fit a true to scale image of a pair of glasses on, on someone's face and position it uh, appropriately on their nose bridge. So we had been working on that for, for years. And then once the true depth camera came out, right, that was a game changer for us. Tell us a little bit about two things, the mission and how that helped you build the business. And then just where did all those glasses go? <laughs> sure. Um, well, in the early days of us sort of putting together the business plan, we thought, okay, well, we're building this brand. We want to build this company that will hopefully sort of disrupt or transform the optical industry. And that's an inherent good to bring down the price of glasses. But we also knew that there's a billion people on the planet um, that didn't have access to glasses. How could we also serve them? To be honest, a lot of the motivation was selfish. We wanted to build a company that we were excited to come to work every day. And we knew that starting our own company was going to be an immense amount of work and that there were going to be lots of days that we were very tired and a lot of sleepless nights. And what would keep us from rolling over and hitting the snooze button in the morning? And that really came down to having positive impact. So I remember having a debate really about how are we going to do that? Should we commit certain percent of revenue or profits to that mission. We sort of thought, well, what's our goal? Our goal is glasses on faces because glasses on faces unlocks the ability to learn. It unlocks right, the ability to earn an income. Um, so why don't we commit for every pair of glasses we sell, we distribute one to someone in need. Um, and we thought, that sounds great. That's a bold commitment. It will be easy for customers to understand. You know, on the same token, we recognize that people are going to buy our glasses, not because we did good in the world, because they look good, they were good quality, and they were well-priced. Most importantly, it was going to motivate us, and we thought that it would help us attract and retain talent. And we've actually found that it's the number one reason why people come and work for Warby Parker is because of our social mission, because we want to provide vision to all. So it's been really exciting. You know, in the early days, we were only distributing glasses overseas. You know, the nonprofit that I used to run, uh, we're now the number one donor too, which is pretty cool. We serve a lot of communities where people are living on less than $4 a day. It's actually horrifying that so many kids in America don't have the glasses that, that they need. And we found that we would go into classrooms and about one in four kids didn't have the glasses that they needed. One of the things that's been really exciting is that we worked with Johns Hopkins to do a three-year longitudinal study on the impact of glasses in the classroom. Wow. And we found that a pair of glasses is the equivalent of three months of additional schooling, which is one of the most effective educational interventions period. So more impact than um, extending the school day, than private tutoring, than computers in classrooms. Um, so uh, we're going to work to make sure that every kid in America has the glasses they need. But what are your predictions? What do you see coming? And where, 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 what are you excited about? Yeah, I think that's never been easier to start a company, which I think is really exciting and unlocks a lot of innovation and, and opportunity. Um, but I think that it's never been more challenging to scale a business and particularly a consumer brand. And I think part of that is that there's a lot of noise out there. So it's hard to sort of break through. Customer acquisition has gotten more expensive over the last 10 years or so, particularly as you look at the concentration uh, in sort of social media, for example, um, and how effective those companies have been at charging rents, right, and, and extracting money through advertising. The cost of capital has increased in the last few years, which also makes it more challenging to, to scale. I think what I'm very excited about is the promise of AI, um, in particular generative uh, AI. Most companies have been using some form of AI for at least 10 years now. You know, what tends to happen 
as uh, a new technology becomes normalized, it comes up with a, a different name. So machine learning used to be called artificial intelligence, but now we all know it as, as machine learning. I'm excited about what it means if we think about eye care in particular, can we bring down the cost of retinal imaging? And then can we use AIs to read those retinal images? So we might be able to identify eye disease or other forms of diseases much earlier so we can treat it more effectively. Could Warby Parker and folks in the eye care space actually serve um, as a first line of, of defense for health, for example, if we can identify stuff um, based on uh, your eye. And as they say, the eyes are the windows to your soul. You're actually, there's a lot of health information that you can learn by taking an image of your retina, of the, of the back of uh, your eye. Um, so that's something that uh, I'm really excited about. Last question on the business. You guys went public in 2021 via direct listing to have such an incredible milestone happen like in the depths of COVID. Just talk about your lessons that you've learned um, and maybe what surprised you specifically. First of all, that milestone and just being at the New York Stock Exchange is just a pretty special life moment for, for sure. I think a few things sort of changed when we went public. You know, we switched from a C Corp to a bub public benefit corporation. And a public benefit corporation enables the board to consider all of our stakeholders, um, not just our shareholders, but obviously including our shareholders um, when we're making decisions. Uh, we were one of the first national retailers to close all of our stores during COVID as we didn't know, you know what was happening with this virus, how it was spread. It, was it going to overrun sort of hospitals? And we had started to see that already in New York where, where we're headquartered. We made that decision because it was the right decision to do, and we continued to pay our store employees um, even though they, they couldn't work. And while I can certainly rationalize that this was the right thing to do because because eventually it helped us recruit and retain talent when other folks ended up having a labor shortage. But I don't feel like I need to justify doing the right thing because we have the right legal structure in place and I can consider uh, the interests of our employees when making you know, big decisions like that. Having that in place definitely gave us confidence or going public that we would stay focused on the right things and we would stay focused on the, on the long term. And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Neil, I want to transition to you. In the rear view mirror, was there something that your parents did that you almost like attribute like a direct line to your ability to be successful today? I think I learned a lot about curiosity from my father. My father, no matter where we were, where we were walking, was always explaining things to me and then posing questions to me and just using every moment as a learning opportunity. Um, and I think to be a great leader, a great executive, a great entrepreneur, right, you need to be constantly learning and, and getting better at everything that you do. My mother was a nurse for 40 years, and she was always the first to volunteer to take somebody to the hospital if they were sick or visit them if they had just had surgery. Um, and I learned a lot from her just around empathy and, and, and being there for friends. Um, and I think that that sort of in, inspired my desire to, to have impact. You've always had this slow and steady wins the race mentality. And that doesn't mean you don't do things urgently and take big swings. But you have had a, I'm not going to do things that I don't do well, stick to it in this. Where does that come from? It's funny now, like if I'm investing in a startup, one of the things that I'm looking for in a founder is like, are they thoughtful and deliberate? Have they thought through everything? I, I think it might actually come from... My college education, I majored in international relations um, and history. And one of the things that becomes abundantly clear, especially when looking at foreign policy, for example, is just the law of unintended consequences and that there are always unpredicted and unintended second and third order effects of things. So I know that when I'm trying to do something, I want to predict outcomes as best as possible, but also know that there are going to be some things that are unknown and we're going to discover. Sometimes those things are bad. <laughs> so what can we do 
to learn quickly and then adapt to ensure that you have as much good inco- uh, outcomes as possible and then scale those good outcomes. You know, if I think about uh, the early days of Warby Parker, our product roadmap was very sort of deliberate. Yeah, I think we've always believed it's important to move quickly but deliberately and build and invest in a strong foundation, then that will enable you to have further growth. And it's better to have sustainable growth and compounding growth year after year after year, as opposed to, you know, shoot up towards the sun, get too close and sort of, you know, have an Icarus situation and and fall down to earth. How have you learned to manage the stress and like what habit or trick or anything that you can you pay forward to others about how you've learned to manage really intense levels of stress? I wish I had great answers here. I think that I've found in life that often just the basics are what are required to have impact. And I often think about the 80-20 rule. So if we take health for example, everyone's always looking for a particular pill or something that's going to optimize them, help them live forever. But at the end of the day, right, the basics are eat healthy, exercise, and sleep, right? And that's 80% of it, if not more. So before folks try to like optimize for the one to 2%, let's focus on the basics. So I found you know, from a stress perspective, my days are better if I can walk to work. Um, and sometimes that can be a 45 minute walk if I'm dropping off my kids at school. So often I'll try and do that. Um, can I exercise? Can I try and go to sleep at a reasonable time? Um, and, you know, do you say no to certain things? Just like in business, strategy is what you say no to, right? The same applies for your personal life uh, as well, that often you need to just prioritize. You know, managing stress often requires taking care of oneself, eating right, exercising, you know, sleeping. Last question before we move to just a quick fire round. What do you hold as sacred, right? You've been a fabulous entrepreneur. You've been really successful. What is the thing that kind of is like the sacred glass that you will not break or would never break that you've kind of kept with you this whole time? Empathy, right? Uh, Building a business, a good one needs to be customer or client focused. You can't be customer or client focused if you're not empathetic and think about them and their needs and what problems you're going to solve for them and think about every part of that customer or client journey. Think about being a good friend or family member, right, requires uh, empathy, especially when there are challenging times and that appears to happen more and more frequently now. And as a leader, I need to sort of think about that as I look to understand sort of my team and what their expectations are for me, for example, right? I can only understand that if I'm empathetic and I'm putting myself in, in their shoes. Um, Neil, I'm going to move to a quick fire round. I'm just going to ask a few questions. First thing that comes to mind is the best answer. What gets you up every day? Typically my kids. <laughs> <laughs> what is the question you like to ask in an interview to really understand who somebody is? I think it's if this person is a leader or a manager, so tell me about a time when you were managing somebody who is underperforming and what you did to help them thrive. Um, I find that that's super important. Also, sometimes I'll ask somebody, hey, tell me about a time where you had an emotional reaction to something. Like, I want to understand what, what drives somebody. And emotional reaction doesn't always mean something negative. It can be super positive as well. And I want to understand what, again, what moves somebody, what, what drives somebody. When you think about a book, any book, doesn't have to be a business book, just a book that you've read that has left a dent in your life, what book? I would say... One was uh, the originals by Adam Grant and disclosure, Warby Parker is mentioned in it, but I found it very validating because it dismisses the notion that all founders, you know, are 20 year olds who drop out of school and take these giant leaps of faith to sort of pursue their goal of starting a business. Um, Whereas the vast majority of entrepreneurs in the U.S. are often in their 30s or their 40s. They've uh, worked uh, so they understand 
problems and how to serve customers and, and, and clients and have started a business at that point. And they're actually great at de-risking things. So this myth that you have to often take these giant leaps of faith and risk everything is actually not necessarily the case. And I find in my own life, when I'm faced with a very challenging decision and it almost looks like you're looking over the cliff into the abyss, that maybe you, instead of jumping, maybe you take a step back and figure out like, hey, is there an easier way down and a couple steps that I can take as opposed to having to you know, make this giant leap of faith? Is there a quote or a mantra or just a saying that really speaks to you? I think one is happiness equals reality minus expectations. So if we think about it as a business, we need to constantly be creating better and better customer experiences, creating better reality for our customers because their expectations are constantly increasing and they're increasing because we're delivering better and better customer experiences, but they're also, you know, those expectations are increasing because they're buying other product from Amazon and it's showing up later that day. They're ordering an Uber, which, you know, it's still like a magical thing that from your phone, you press a button and suddenly a taxi arrives. And we know that those expectations are, are constantly shifting. And I also think about that in the context of our employees, of friends, of my kids, right? What are their expectations and how do I make sure that I'm exceeding them to keep them happy? If you have to think of your biggest pinch me moment, like the moment, and I don't mean like necessarily you took the company public, but a moment that in the rear view mirror was like one of the best days you've ever had at Warby Parker, what happened? It was pretty cool. Uh, I grew up on 8th Street, not too far from Union Square. I had happened to be in uh, the Union Square subway station and I was on the platform and I saw somebody wearing our glasses for the first time. And of course, I wasn't sure. So I started getting close to them and kind of following them on the platform, which not always the best idea it tends to freak people out, but I just wanted to get a closer glimpse of the glasses that this person was wearing. And that was pretty awesome. Last question is just give a shout out to a startup. So something that has nothing to do with Warby Parker. It can be an idea of innovation, a startup you backed, but something that you're really excited about outside of your realm that we should all know about or check out. There's a very cool company called Forta Health, and they're helping serve kids with autism. Um, there is uh, a shortage of trained therapists, and uh, they're creating tools to create the next generation of clinicians and therapists, and also providing advice and guidance to parents and even providing training for parents that will enable them actually to get health insurance reimbursements for um, helping to take care of their kids. That's really exciting to me because it's serving the public good and it's using technology to right, provide more access to care. Um, so yeah, Florida Health is um, a company that immediately comes to mind. That's wonderful. First of all, Neil, thanks so much for just being such an incredible leader in our ecosystem uh, and for being a great neighbor and, and friend. Everybody out there, if you want to learn more about Warby Parker, check out warbyparker.com, buy some amazing glasses. I think I own about 20 pairs. Um, and then if you haven't walked into a store, please do. It is a wonderful experience. And you can join us next week for Ink the Founders Project with Alex Von Tobel. Neil, we're rooting for you. I can't wait to see what the next decade of your life holds. Thank you so much for everything you brought to the tech ecosystem. Thank you. 